I want to first welcome everybody to our fifth Polly Jones Symposium of Rising Scholars. The goal of this is to really celebrate student work and all of the accomplishments of students in the research that they've conducted so far in our program. My name is Tyler. I'm the Student Success Coordinator with Polygents, and I'll be one of the judges for today's session along with Andrew Smith, who's joining us, and he's a PhD candidate at Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania. So judges uh, together will judge your presentations uh, for those prizes at the end, um, and those prizes will be announced uh, at a later date after we compile all of our, our scores and everything. Um, if you have questions during the session, feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. We do have a full group of five students presenting today, so that means we need to be really mindful of the time. So you have eight minutes to present your work, two minutes for Q&A. At the end of that 10 minute total block, I will ask you to leave uh, the screen so that we can make sure we have enough time for all of our student presenters. Um, but we're so excited for the presentations today. We're going to start with Rohil Shah, and he is a senior at Lindbrook High School. And I'm going to click Rohil for you to start to share your screen. Hello. Hi, I can see you and I hear your audio, so you're all set. Sounds good. I will share my screen. Oh, am I only able to share um, Chrome tabs? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, okay, well, I I think that should be okay. <laughs> I will share <laughs> Chrome tabs. Do you have it downloaded as a PowerPoint? I do, but I also have the presentation. OK, perfect. Thank you. And and for other students, if you're presenting a PowerPoint, then that would be a case where you could share your whole screen. Um, so that's also an option. Great. All right, take it away. All right, sounds good. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Rohil, and this is my algorithm learning game presentation. So just a little bit about me really quickly. Um, as um, Tyler mentioned, I am a senior at Lindbergh High School. I'm interested in CS and physics. I'm also part of engineering and robotics club. Um, but let's get into the content. So here's an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about essentially the problem and solution, um, why my um, project um, solves a problem. Um, I'll also be giving some screenshots to my project. I will also be giving my personal and overall motivations for why I wanted to do this project. Then I'll quickly go over some technical challenges, because I think they're pretty interesting. And then I'll talk about some future development for the project itself. So the problem, CS algorithms are very unintuitive. Um, that is just very simply put, they are difficult to understand and they're um, complex mathematically and conceptually. In some ways, it is analogous to learning a new language. Um, it is uh, difficult to learn new syntax. So um, if I put up this table right here, um, on the left side, you can see that there is print hello world written in Python, and then also system.out.print hello world in Java. So you can see that there's two different ways to write the exact same um, functionally similar code. And these syntactic differences um, can be seen when learning a new language. For example, of course, between English and Russian, um, it's going to be totally different. Now, this is a very intuitive concept. You don't, I don't have to tell you this, but I think it's a pretty good way to visualize how difficult it can be to learn CS algorithms. Um, it can also be very difficult to visualize. Um, if you're trying to sort a list of numbers, it can be difficult to um, understand what is going on with that list since you're pretty much just flipping bits. Um, it is also impossible to visualize some concepts or it's so difficult that it's just not worth it. So the solution here is, um, number one, maybe you can use your brain. Maybe you can look at a, a bunch of code and you can trace it with your brain and you can try to find out exactly what variables are changing when and how the logic flows. Um, you can maybe use a paper and a pencil to aid your brain. Um, however, both of these methods are error prone and it's also very time consuming. So one of the, uh, a nice solution is to have a custom tool. For example, if we continue with the language learning example, you can use a tool like Duolingo. If you have not heard of Duolingo, it is a very nice language learning website that essentially gamifies the process of um, learning a language. So that is the final point of the solution. Uh, you essentially need a game-like interface to engage people um, and have them learn the best that they can. 
So my project is essentially supposed to be the perfect solution. So let's dive into some of the screenshots from my application. Here is the landing page that you might see. Um, it is also the first level of the application. Um, just to give a little bit of context here, the first challenge that is presented to you to learn CS algorithms is a um, sorting problem. So you are given a list of unsorted numbers, and you are supposed to sort them in ascending order. So the way I've chosen to visualize it is bars of differing lengths. And you can see that on the right. There, there are unsorted bars of differing lengths, and you want them to be all ascending. And um, you essentially have to write code in the top left to um, sort the bars. So if I go to the next slide, you can see that after I've written the code and run the code, all the bars are perfectly sorted. And um, this is essentially um, a, a platform where people can mess around and do their best with trying to sort these bars. And if you get it wrong, then the bars will show that. And that is a good way to visualize it. So um, in that way, it solves the problem. I also just want to quickly highlight the, the, the level menu um, just to show that um, uh, there, there are more levels, and there are different types of sorting algorithms. And it's not just um, limited to sorting algorithms. There can be really anything. Um, and you can go uh, pretty much anywhere with this um, with this platform. So quickly, just going into some, per some of my personal motivations for this project, um, I wanted to take on the technical challenge of building a website. I thought it would be a lot of fun, and I thought I would learn a lot. I also did not know any of these sorting algorithms in the first place. <laughs> so um, I needed to learn these algorithms in order to teach them. Um, and I think I have um, achieved these goals in, in some regard. Uh, moving on to my overall motivations, just what I want this project to be and uh, what I want it to do for people. Of course, I wanted to solve the problem of CS being unintuitive. And based off of that, my target audience is essentially helping, for example, interviewees. The software interview process can be very difficult at times because um, interviewers are looking for uh, very, very precise um, answers to uh, software problems. And um, you have to do a lot of memorization. And having a gamified tool like the one I showed you essentially uh, simplifies this process and makes it a lot nicer. And by nature of the fact that it's almost like a game, um, it may be targeted to a slightly younger audience. I'm not talking about uh, elementary school students, but I feel like maybe middle school students would um, have some benefit or, or, or see some utility in having a site like this because it's more interactive and it's more fun for them. And then, of course, anyone. If anyone is interested in learning um, CS algorithms, then this site will really, um, will really just make it easier. My philosophy for learning is essentially that you need to get your hands dirty if you want to learn something at its core. And this website essentially helps you do that. You're not reading a textbook. You're not just solving problems or listening to a lecture. You're getting your hands dirty, and you're writing. Uh, you're writing code, and you're seeing how that code interacts with software, uh, with um, with bits and bytes. Um, so that's essentially why I think this um, is a great solution, and uh, why I was motivated to work on it. So quickly moving on to some ch technical challenges that I faced. Um, the two that I'm going to highlight are SQL injections and unlimited code execution. Now, they may sound a little daunting, but they are very simple concepts, um, just with uh, really fancy names. So moving into SQL injections, essentially the problem here is that when code is submitted, um, or, or when a user wants to run code, you can think of it as um, they are writing it to a file, and it is put in a filing cabinet. Now, that filing cabinet is open to all users. All users can access everything in the filing cabinet. Um, my code is right next to the other user's code, which is next to another user's code, and it's all right next to each other in a filing cabinet. Now, this can be abused very easily, because someone could just say, hey, I want to burn the filing cabinet. And then everyone's code is deleted, and it's very dangerous. So to protect against this abuse, we use this thing called prepared statements. Now, I won't get into the details of prepared statements, but if you want to search it up, you can. Essentially, what it does is it checks the uh, filing cabinet, instructions sent to the filing cabinet, and it makes sure that you are not doing anything malicious, you're not doing anything bad. Um, it just keeps everything safe. It, it puts a lock on the filing cabinet if something goes bad. The other issue is unlimited code execution. When the user writes code and hits run. The code needs to be run somewhere. Um, it is not run on their computer, just due to the nature of how browsers work. It is sent back to another computer, and then it is run on that computer. And that computer I host, or at least it's my computer, and it's plugged into my power outlet. So what I'm doing, essentially, is giving out free compute power. Anyone could write code and run it on my machine, and then maybe extract work from it. And my electricity bill would go through the roof, because people would be using this all the time, and it's very much open to abuse. So the solution for this is containers. Um, 
what uh, it, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It just takes the code, it puts it in a container on the second computer, and it just runs it within that container. And it puts a limit on runtime, and it puts a limit on uh, memory usage so that it cannot exceed some certain limits. And it's just in its little own bubble. Um, and it can't leave that bubble, essentially. Um, so those are two of the technical challenges that I faced. Um, and these are technical challenges that a lot of um, software developers face. Um, Facebook faces it, Google faces it, and these solutions are quite well known. So just moving into some future development, I want to make this project open source, um, have anyone contribute, because I feel like having a, a good community behind this project will allow it to grow. There will be more levels, more explanations, more solutions, more animations. And uh, not only will other people get to learn, but I will also get to learn from other people. Um, some other features that I was pretty interesting, uh, that I was pretty interested in having, um, but I didn't have time um, for for now, is um, building out an account system and having statistics that you can look at and watch your improvement, and um, also just having um, um, a more fleshed out reward system, so you feel rewarded when you um, do write an algorithm that sorts something faster. I also was interested in having maybe a placement test so that you know where you are. Like you're maybe you're not on sorting level one or level two, maybe you're at sorting level three, and having a placement test can just say that, okay, you can skip these first two. Um, but yeah, those are just ideas for future development. I think that um, the website um, as it is right now um, is definitely very functional, um, but um, I'd be very happy to uh, expand on it in the future. So that is about it. Um, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And are there any questions? Great, thank you so much. Uh, and so feel free to put any questions into the chat or the q and I did see a question uh, in the Q&A. Let me pull it up. Uh, and this question is, how does this compare to other ways to learn computer science? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I mean, if you take a computer science course, uh, let's say at university, at a university, you'll maybe buy a huge intro to algorithms textbook. And then you will go to a lecture. And then you will do problems from the textbook. Um, that it can work. It can work for some people. Um, maybe you go through that course, and then you forget everything, and then you cram it all before an interview. Um, but I feel like uh, this tool is essentially a way to learn rather than cram or forget. You know, um, uh, of course, everyone's learning styles are different. Um, this is what personally works for me. But I, I think I have a hunch that other people are going to like the fact that it's, um, it's a game, and uh, and you and you enjoy and you enjoy solving these problems. Yeah, I totally agree with your philosophy there. Um, and so, is this? Do you have a link that you'd be able to share with us in, into the chat so that we can take a look? Yeah, unfortunately, I do not. Um, yeah, that was one of my goals, um, but uh, I unfortunately I cannot. Um, the, really, the main issue with that is um, I have to either pay for someone to host the site, or I have to host it myself. And hosting myself opens up a lot of security considerations, much more than just SQL injections and that kind of stuff. So um, anyways, it, it, is, it is a project for the future. I would love to host it on my own. Amazing. Great job. And we do have to move on to the next student presenter. But mm -hmm. if you have other questions for Rohil as he's in the room, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A, and he can take a look at them there. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I will stop sharing. Okay. Yep, you can just hit that Leave button. Next up is Savio, and Savio is a junior at Amador Valley High School. Okay. I can hear you well, and I can see okay. the video. Um, tab. All right, can you see this? Yes. All right. OK, I'll start. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Savio Joseph. And my goal by the end of this presentation is to show you how to build a gimbal model rocket. And if those words don't make sense right now, I'll explain what my project actually is more in depth in the upcoming slides. And before I forget, um, my mentor for this project was Spencer. And he helped me a lot throughout this project. And if it weren't for him, um, I probably wouldn't have gotten much done. And also, if you have any questions at the end of this presentation, you can just email me at sjsavioj at gmail.com. All right, so before I move on, I would like you guys to know a little bit more about myself. So right now, uh, I'm a junior at Amador Valley High School. It's located in Pleasanton, California. 
And at school, I really like to learn math and science and some fun things I like to do other than studies are running, playing soccer, playing basketball and hanging out with my friends at the park. And I'm also right now a part-time worker at Kumon where I tutor kids on math and reading. And it's something I really look forward to doing every day. So in order to understand what my project is really doing, we need to answer these few, uh, these two questions first. So the first one is how do regular model rockets work? And the second one is what am I doing with model rockets and or what my project is? So a regular model rocket is constructed by taking some sort of like pre-made uh, rocket tube rocket tube and connecting it with a nose cone on the top and an engine mount on the bottom of the rocket where the engine will be placed. Additionally, from the bottom of the rocket, there will be three fins, which will be spanning outwards, which will be used to stabilize the rocket while it is flying. There are many more parts to a model rocket, but they're not needed for the sake of your understanding. So this is how like normal model rockets work. Now that we know that how a regular model rocket works, we can look at what my model rocket is doing. So my model rocket is completely the same as a regular model rocket, except for the fact that it doesn't use fins. So if it doesn't have fins, then how will the rocket stabilize itself? Well, you have to make a ve thrust vector control rocket. This means that instead of keeping the rocket engine in a fixed position, like in the previous uh, model rocket, you'll have to change the angle of the engine in order to stabilize the rocket. And you can see this happening on the right image where uh, there's this gimbal that's adjusting the angle of the engine. So uh, that's basically what I'm trying to build the, the image that's on the right side of the screen. And now since you guys kind of probably understand uh, what my project is, I'll now go into all the main hardware components required to make this gimbal rocket. So first off, we will need two servos and the first servo will control one of the axes at which the engine will rotate. So it might control this axis. And the second servo will control the second axis, which is perpendicular to the other axis. So it might control like this one. Now, in order to tell the servos what angle it should move to, we need a microcontroller that will have the program, which will decide the angle at which the servo should move to. Um, but in order to, for the program to know what angle the servo should go to, we need to know the angle of the rocket. And in order to get this angle, we can use an IMU or an inertial measurement unit, which will provide us with the angle of the rocket. So if the, if the rocket is like tilted this way, then it will it will tell us um, the angle of the rocket and then we can use that in our program. Additionally, some other hardware components, we need our battery to power the whole system, some wires to make some basic connections, an SD's rocket engine to provide the thrust, a rocket tube to make the actual rocket and several other small components like screws, nuts, bolts, and rods. Okay, so we talked about what hardware you need to buy, but the crux of this project is making the gimbal that will be responsible for adjusting the angle of this engine. Now, what you see on the screen is the gimbal I designed on Fusion 360. This gimbal will be responsible for rotating uh, the engine mount of the rocket so we can stabilize the rocket if it is not at zero degrees. In the two places marked as the mounts for the servo, that will obviously be the place where the servos are fixed into their positions. The servos will be able to rotate the engine mount by pushing a rod that is fixed into place in the push rod hole marked in the diagram. And this will all make more sense in the next slide. Uh, additionally, there's another servo mount with another push rod in the back side of the gimbal, and this will control the rotation of the other axes that is perpendicular to the axis of the first servo I mentioned. Okay, so in order to make things a bit more clear, as I said, said in the previous slide, on the left image, I got a setup version uh, of the gimbal that I fully 3D printed and assembled at home. And as you can see, the rod is both uh, connected to the engine mount and it's also connected to the servo horn. So when the servo rotates, it will basically push the, not push, it will rotate the engine mount to a, um, so that we can provide some sort of counter thrust. And on the left side, we got a view uh, from the top of the gimbal where all the electronics sit. In the middle, we have the microcontroller and that contains the program to calculate uh, where the servo should go to. And we also have an IMU, which is the small blue chip in the upper part of the picture. And at the bottom, we have our nine volt battery, which powers the whole system. And after setting this all up, all I had to do was secure this into the bottom of the rocket. And I also have this right here with me. And it's right now it's like running the program. So if the rocket is tilted this way, then the engine will point this way so that 
so it will provide a thrust to move it back towards um, uh, an angle of zero. All right. Uh, so now that we know, so okay, so now that we got our hardware done, we have to write a program that will properly tell the hardware what to do in order to balance the rocket. And we will do this by using a PID algorithm. So in really non-mathy terms, a PID algorithm works by taking an error. And in our case, the error would be the angle at which the rocket is misaligned from being straight. Then the PID algorithm will multiply that error by a number P. It will also, and it will also um, add up all the errors that have accumulated over time and multiply that by a number I. Or if you know calculus, it's gonna integrate all the errors and multiply that by a number I. And it will also take the change in error over time, or if you know calculus, the derivative of the error, and it will multiply that by D, by, by a number D. And the PID will sum all those products together, and that answer, which will be an angle, will tell the server what angle the engine should be at so that the rocket can get closer to stabilizing itself. However, for my project, I used a PD controller instead of a PID, since I didn't really need the I or integral part of the control. However, in order to actually get the correct uh, PD values, uh, you need to actually test the rocket and see what PD values work best to stabilize it. Since testing a rocket takes a lot of time and money, I decided to simulate the physics of the rocket in order to quickly run tests on different PED values. Okay, so this is basically a simulation. And for the simulation, I just uh, solved for the equation of the angle of the rocket with respect to the torque that is applied to the rocket from the thrust of the engine and the angle. And additionally, I also had to calculate the mass moment of inertia and moment arm in order to calculate in order to calculate this. And once I got that equation, I, ra I ran a simulation where the PD controller would uh, execute at 50 hertz or every 0 0.02 seconds. And at each of those 0 0.02 seconds, it will tell the servo to go to some position in order to correct the rocket. And in this image above, it shows a simulation where the blue line represents the angle of the rocket in degrees and the yellow line, or orange, orange or yellow line represents the angle at which the engine was directed to go at in order to compensate for the air. And as you can see, this rocket did not stabilize well since it wasn't able to stabilize at zero degrees. So it started at like zero seconds, it started at like negative 10 degrees and then it like overshot at zero degrees, went to 20 degrees and it overshot again at zero degrees, so it's completely like going crazy. However, after I tuned the values for the P and D, so before the P value was 10, the D value is one, I mean the P value five and the D value 1.35, uh, the rocket was able to stabilize at around, after like around 0 0.8 seconds, and you can kind of see that how the blue line kind of just like uh, tapers off, like flattens at uh, zero degrees. Okay, so when I was done constructing my rocket, I couldn't actually fly it due to some state laws. So I did a static test where I placed the rocket on a rotating hinge and I just fired it. Um, ideally, we would want to see the rocket balance itself and stay straight. However, due to many outside factors like uh, my poor servos, uh, my ch they were really cheap, and uh, the wind and the hinge design, the rocket was not able to balance itself and it kept moving back and forth. So I'll try playing the video. Yeah, and also, uh, if you look closely enough, you could kind of see um, the the engine moving in order to, in order for in order to compensate for the air, but it's kind of hard to see. So, uh, going into the future, I'll try to improve my project by making a more realistic simulation by adding, including uh, taking into account the outside factors like wind and noise. I will also try improving the gimbal design by making it smaller and more accurate. And I might also consider trying to get more expensive servos to achieve a uh, higher accuracy as well. And planning on launching a rocket soon in like November when um, uh, the launch sites become open here in California. Um, it's not changing, all right. Now there's a lot of stuff I skipped over due to our limit on time, but I hope that you learned something new from my project. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Awesome job, <laughs> really cool. Um, and we do are a little short on time, but a few quick questions. One, I'm curious, like, why are we eliminating uh, fins? Why do you want to eliminate fins? From yeah. 
So yeah, I was, I was going to include that in the slides, but like I didn't really have that much time. So basically, like uh, why, why I did this project was because um, most commercial uh, rockets, they don't use fins. And whereas like a lot of model rockets, they use fins. So I just kind of want to eliminate that disconnect between model rockets and uh, commercial rockets. And, and also fins are I don't not that ones use fins. Why? Why? Oh, it's because uh, with the thrust vector control, uh, it's, they have more like uh, capacity to like uh, keep the rocket stabilized. And uh, when they go into when the rockets go into space, uh, there's really no point in using fins because there's no air there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, let's see. We have a Q and A. Uh, a question is, how would you compensate for environmental factors such as wind? Uh, yeah, so I would just uh, probably like add some kind of a noise into the simulation. And so maybe like when the rock when the rocket is like, uh, when I'm t like, I might uh, um, kind of add some bumps to the data. And then I'll probably get different PD values that could probably uh, compensate for the wind. Great. Yeah. I think I have other questions for you, so I'll add some more into the Q and A. But we are going to move on to the next student presenter. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, and you can click that leave yeah. button. And then, so next okay. up is Pranav Karthik, and uh, that's a senior at Evergreen Valley High School. Pranav, you're up. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to try to share. Um, you can, I can't, let me even see that, right? I can. Your audio is a little low for me. Maybe if you move oh. a little bit closer. Is that a little better? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll just get started. Um, what is dark matter and what could it look like? Um, so first, a little bit about me. My name is Pranav Karthik, and as already mentioned, I'm a senior at Evergreen Valley High School in San Jose, California. Um, so I'm mainly interested in astrophysics and biology, and in my free time, I like playing basketball and reading. Um, I would like to thank my mentor, Julia, for helping me out with my paper and my presentation. And I would also like to thank Polygens for giving me a platform to work with this experienced mentor and present my research to this audience. Um, so with that out of the way, I can begin um, so what exactly is dark matter? It is an invisible type of matter that does not interact with the electromagnetic force or light. It primarily interacts with gravity and it makes up a larger chunk of our universe than visible matter that we see and interact with. Less than 5% of all matter and energy in our universe is visible matter and close to 24% is dark matter. Currently, it has only been viewed uh, indirectly through its gravitational effects on other large objects and its existence was theorized in 1933 by Fritz Zwicky, who realized that the matter in a galaxy did not produce enough gravitational force to hold the galaxy together, and there must be some other matter there that is holding it. Um, so why do we care what dark matter is and what importance does it have? So pictured to the left is the standard model of our universe, and it sort of depicts all elementary particles in our universe that we know of. Um, so the ones I'll focus on right now are these gauge bosons in orange. Each gauge boson is linked to one of the fundamental forces in, of our universe, and it's sort of why we're, we, other particles can experience that force. So there are four fundamental forces in our universe, which are gravity, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. So the photon, as shown here, is associated with the electromagnetic force and is why we are able to actually see things. Um, the gluon is associated with the strong nuclear force, and it is what holds atoms together. And the weak nuclear force is associated with both the, w, the W and Z boson, and it is why uh, atoms are able to fuse in our sun, and it's sort of what fuels our sun and every other star. But at this time, we don't know what gravity's gauge boson is. And as I mentioned, dark matter primarily interacts with the gravitational force, and it has a high link with gravity. gravity. So it is possible that if we discover what dark matter is, uh, the greater understanding of gravi gravity that it would come with would help us find that missing boson, and it could re or lead to a rewrite of uh, the standard model of physics. Um, so I'll just briefly discuss one dark matter proof, and that is through galaxy cluster collisions. 
Um, so a cluster, galaxy clusters are just clusters of galaxies, and it can have anywhere from hundreds to thousands of galaxies within them. When these galaxy clusters collide, they behave differently from when they are not colliding. Um, so the gas that makes up the vast majority of these clusters collide with each other and heat up, and this releases a lot of extras. Um, so this, this, this is sort of depicted below in sort of like uh, a model of two galaxy clusters colliding that were observed in 2006, which is now known as the bullet cluster. So these red and white blobs are the X-ray emissions that we see from the colliding gas. And these green circles are the centers of mass, which we were able to determine by examining gravitational lensing. And gravitational lensing is just the bending of light due to the force of gravity, because light wants to travel in a straight line, but it can sort of be offset by different forces, including gravity. Um, and determining where gravitational lensing is the strongest helps us determine where the gravitational force is also the strongest. And it was observed that where we see the gravitational force to be is not where we also see matter, which means that we know that gravity only interacts with matter and that if where we see matter is not where gravity is, there must be some other matter that we cannot see, and that matter is dark matter. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about the three most well-known dark matter candidates, and these particles are still all hypothetical, and we don't even know if they exist. Um, so the first proposed one is the axion, which in addition to primarily interacting with gravity, like any dark matter candidate would, it interacts with a strong and weak nuclear force. Um, it has a wide range of potential mass, ranging from anywhere from a tenth to three times the size of an electron. But either way, they would have to be highly abundant to make up the 24% of mass in our universe. Um, it would have a spin of zero, and spin is just another way to differentiate particles and sort of give them a different classification. And scientists try to find axions by exposing them to a magnetic field. And this would cause an axion to decay into two photons. So these particles were initially proposed to solve a different problem in the strong nuclear force and have over time shifted into a dark matter candidate. Um, so now are WIMPs or a weakly interacting massive particle. It interacts with the weak nuclear force in addition to the, gra the gravity um, we are unsure of WIMP's mass, but it is predicted to be heavier than any other elementary particle. Um, its spin is also unknown, and scientists look for WIMPs through WIMP annihilation, which is when two WIMPs collide and sort of just like destroy themselves, and they sort of become nothing, and this would produce gamma rays. Um, so the third uh, dark matter candidate and the final one I will be talking about here is the sterile neutrino which only interacts with the gravitational force. Um, so neutrinos are a, a group of elementary particles that are sort of pictured here, and they have the properties of interacting with gravity and the weak nuclear force, um, but sterile neutrinos do not interact with the weak nuclear force. They have a very small mass, and they have a spin of one half, um, just like the sterile neutrino. So the, only, the biggest difference between the sterile neutrino and the other types of neutrinos we know exist is that it does not interact with the weak nuclear force. Um, one way that scientists try to look for the sterile neutrino is through X-ray radiation when the particle decays. And the particle decays when it interacts with normal neutrinos. However, results have been wildly inconsistent and older data sets that uh, sort of made scientists assume that the sterile neutrino exists does not line up very well with current data sets. But there have been recent developments in searches for the sterile neutrino, meaning there is still optimism that this will be uh, discovered to be dark matter. Um, so I guess we'll just quickly take a look at a few search attempts for each uh, particle. ADMX is one axion search experiment, um, and it uses a large electromagnet that would cause an axion to decay if the axion existed into two photons, as I mentioned earlier. And this is sort of just a depiction of the detector that is being used. Um, CREST is a WIMP search that tries to find energy released by dark matter when it collides with an atomic nuclei. So they have like a detector, and within that detector is a nuclei, and particles can come and go through this detector, and they sort of try to see if, so if dark matter would collide with this nuclei, it would release some energy, and that is what scientists try to look for there. And for uh, sterile neutrinos, one such experiment is CATRIN, which is a sterile neutrino search that analyzes beta decay. And beta decay is just a type of decay when a particle sort of decays into an electron and a neutrino. And we know that for sure, but it is also believed that a sterile neutrino would be emitted through this decay, 
And that is what uh, the, this experiment is trying to look for. Um, so overall, despite the fact that none of these experiments have found dark matter yet, scientists are still very optimistic about these experiments. And the profound implications they could have on all of physics is more than enough reason to continue looking for it. As discovering the, if dark matter were to help us discover uh, gravity's gauge boson, it could uh, help us uh, take us one step closer to the theory of everything. And the theory of everything would be an all-encompassing theory that would fully explain all aspects of physics in our universe. And it is a very far-fetched idea and not something that um, is likely to happen, but uh, help, uh, it would help us discover more of how the physics of our universe works, and that is really cool. Um, so yeah, these are just some of the sources I use for images, and that's it. Thank you. Awesome job. Thank you so much. Uh, and I did see a question roll through uh, the Q&A that was related to a slide. So maybe if you can go to that slide, it says from the first slide, how do we know the percentages of dark matter and energy if we can't observe it? Okay. Um, so we're able to obviously see visible matter and we're able to determine where it is. And although we're not able to see dark matter directly, we are sort of able to see where it is through its indirect effects and also determine where it would be. Um, so basically what they do is they just, uh, over a large period that we're able to observe, they find the visible matter and dark matter percentages and sort of just extrapolate that to the entire universe because it is impossible for us to observe everything. Um, so it is a guess, but it has a very low error percentage. Somebody asked, where are the experiments done? The ones that you, um, Okay. Yeah. yeah, let me go. Um, um, so ADMX and Katrin are both uh, done through the University of Washington, and Crest is associated with UCLA. Cool. Um, does the outcome, so there's these different candidates, is there a different implication for what this all means if it's one candidate over another? Or is it kind of they're both would explain a similar thing? Um, assuming that it's one of these three, there's not really much difference between which one it would be because it would still be a particle that interacts primarily with gravity and it would probably help us find a gravitational gauge boson. Um, so if it's one of these three, it doesn't really have um, much of an effect if, if it's one of these. It's just that uh, different scientists have different ideas or theories about what it could be and that's sort of what they look for. And since we're not entirely sure what it is, their different theories have uh, been proposed, and these are three of them. Awesome. Really excellent job. And similarly, if you have questions that are still rolling in, oh, here's, well, I can't, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that we answer this one too. If you <clears throat> were to pick one of the three theories, one of the theories, which would you pick? Axions or um, I guess I'd probably say axions because I know WIMPs and sterile neutrinos were, I guess, more likely to be the, uh, the dark matter earlier, like with earlier results, but newer results have not really led uh, any findings. And these those searches have been going on for longer. And Axion, there have been more developments in Axion searches than the other two. So I'd go with Axion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's right. Awesome. Thank you so much. And so next up is going to be Mithra. And I am going to... Um, do I click leave or? Yep, you can click leave. Okay. And we can make sure. Oh, sorry. I clicked the wrong one. Uh, um, can you hear me? Wrong one. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Right. Uh, and I can see you. So all is set. And so Mitra right. is a sophomore at Karen Dillette High School. Can you see my screen? Yes, I see it. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mithra Senthal, and my Polygen's project was on childhood trauma and the associated risk factors for bipolar disorder. 
So a little bit about me is I'm a sophomore at Carnivalet High School in Concord, California. And outside of school, I play rugby, the piano, and in my free time, I do a lot of volunteer work. And I'd like to give a big shout out and thanks to my mentor, Shravani, who helped me throughout my whole entire research process and the project as well. So what led me to choose my, my, choose my topic is going into polygens, I really want to do something neuroscience based revolving around teens, which led me to the broad topic on mental disorders. I then chose a specific mental disorder, which was bipolar disorder and found associations connecting to bipolar disorder to help specify my research. And then finally narrowing down to childhood trauma and how it connects to bipolar disorder. So what is bipolar disorder? Bipolar disorder is a mental disorder that causes extreme mood swings ranging from depression to manic states. So in the roller coaster diagram here, it's just showing a visual representation of what of the three main episodes a person with bipolar disorder could experience. So at the highest point is where a person might experience a manic episode, which is where they have an abnormal amount of energy. And then here at the lowest point is where a person might experience a depressive episode where they have a loss of interest or pleasure in life. And then finally in the middle is where a person might experience a hypomanic episode, which is just a milder version of a manic episode. So with bipolar disorder, a person uh, could be diagnosed into three, um, three categories, bipolar disorder type one, which is mainly um, um, manic episodes and a little bit of depressive episodes. And it is the most severe type of bipolar disorder. And it also could also require hospitalized care. And then with bipolar disorder type two, it involves both manic and depressive episodes, but it's just a, um, a less severe version of type one. And then finally, with cyclothymic disorder, it causes a brief episode of both depression, depressive and hypomanic episodes. So analyzing the risk factors of bipolar disorder like childhood trauma could really help mitigate the stigmatized stereotypes put on people diagnosed with childhood trauma. So childhood trauma is a traumatic experience that occurred during a person's childhood. And especially during the neurodevelopment stages could really affect um, their cognitive functions, such as emotional difficulties, cognitive deficiency, altered neural functions, etc. It also decreases their ability to cope with stressors, creating lifetime problems, such as mental illnesses, resulting in childhood trauma being a major risk factor in bipolar disorder. Studies have even reported that patients suffering with bipolar disorder are 2.6 times more likely to report childhood trauma than people who haven't experienced childhood trauma nor have been diagnosed with a mental disorder. So now we're going to revert to the children's adolescence aspect of childhood trauma and how their development of bipolar disorder. So studies have shown that children who have experienced childhood trauma have shown bipolar, bipolar symptoms and are also likely to develop bipolar disorder later on in life. The development of bipolar disorder is usually due to the interplay between genetics and environmental factors, which we will dive more into in the next slide. Um, childhood trauma and bipolar disorder have deprived children of the opportunity for more normal developments cognitively, emotionally, and socially. Children with bipolar disorder have also been shown to um, develop other problems such as anxiety, depression, etc. cetera. Um, children with bipolar disorder have shown to have different experiences compared to adults with bipolar disorder, since their episodes could be um, a various mixes of depression and manic in a shortened uh, span of time. So for example, a child could go through a manic and a depressive episode in a span of three days. And lastly, it is harder to diagnose children with bipolar disorder since their symptoms don't precisely fit the symptom criteria, which is made for adults. So now going back to how um, the environmental and genetic factors um, play a role in the development of bipolar disorder, I here have a family tree where each color is coordinated to either if that person was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, had experienced childhood trauma, had, um, is diagnosed with depression, and, or shows no signs of trauma nor any severe mental disorder. The tree is just supposed to give a more visual representation of how genetically and the environmental factors can be passed down through generations. So for example, if you see um, your grandpa on your dad's side was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, his lack of parenting skills and with all the episodes happening and his behavior um, that was caused by bipolar disorder could have negatively impacted your dad, causing him to have um, experienced childhood trauma. 
that trauma could have carried on into your dad's characteristics in his role as playing a and in his role in his parenting skills, resulting in the developing of bipolar disorder um, to you, like your grandpa. And again, this could have been also a genetic uh, factor. So let's just say um, your great grandma on your mom and dad's side were both diagnosed with bipolar disorder and also your grandpa was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which could have also caused you to di be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So it could be a variation of both environmental and genetic factors or just genetic or environmental factors. So now we're going to go into the more of how bipolar disorder and childhood trauma can affect uh, people later on their, in their adulthood life. So childhood trauma is um, categorized into three main subtypes, emotional abuse slash neglect, sexual abuse, and physical abuse. Emotional abuse is, and neglect is found more in patients with bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder type 1 and type 2. And a study had even found that 54.1% of the in individuals they studied had gone through emotional abuse or neglect. And it's even found a connection between the difficulties in facial emotion recognition. With sexual and physical abuse though, there hasn't been that much studies um, on them, on those subtypes, but here's what we know so far. So one out of every five women have reported sexual abuse and one out of every 13 men have reported sexual abuse. It's also shown a connection to bipolar disorder in patients with bipolar disorder type one and also connection between uh, frequent manic episodes and reports of higher rates of hospitalization. And finally, with physical abuse, it's been reported more by males and has also been a main predictor to drug use, suicidal behaviors, and even severe episodes. And lastly, it also has shown a connection to family history of depression. So lastly, um, we're going to talk about the therapies and the medications and treatment options basically for bipolar disorder. So depending on the patient, it depends on um, how severe their episodes are, how severe the symptoms are. And through that, it, um, a doctor could, die, um, could prescribe them into going to therapy or a medication. So here um, with therapy options, there are mainly behavioral therapy, four main behavioral therapies, family focused therapy, interpers interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then group psychoeducation. And then with medications or not, there isn't a specific type of medication put on patients with bipolar disorder, but there are different, various different types of medications that they can be put on. So they can be put on mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, or even a combination of antipsychotics and antidepressants. And so with um, this field has been, um, is a very, is in the early stages. So there is further research needed into how, into how to best accurately diagnose patients with bipolar disorder, as opposed to other psychiatric disorders that may be bipolar disorder mimics. So bipolar disorder does lack pathophysical, physiological um, indicators and tests that would provide a standard for diagnosis, making it mainly a clinical diagnosis. So to help prevent overdiagnosis, medical professionals should carefully examine the patient's um, symptoms as well as gather their family his medical history, history of um, childhood trauma and prior medical conditions. And then also with further research into subtypes of tra um, childhood trauma and effect on bipolar disorder with more nuanced, nuanced diagnostic criteria may develop in the future, informing more individualized and perhaps more effective bipolar disorder therapies. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you. And so we have about a minute for questions remaining. So feel free to add any questions into the chat or uh, put them in the Q&A. Awesome job. We have a question in the Q&A. What stage of development of children are the impacts of trauma most severe? Um, I'm sorry, do you mind repeating that? Yep, no worries. I'm just going to remove your screen. Yeah. Yeah. What stage of development of children are the impacts of trauma most severe? Um, honestly, it depends on how severe the trauma is. And also, um, like, again, like in, with environmental factors, that can really, um, so it, like, it just depends on the person. One question I have is, what was most surprising to you as you were learning about this topic? Um, was there anything that really struck you? Yeah, so um, honestly, there has been a, a lot of overdiagnosis with bipolar disorder. 
So um, since there has been so many treatment options with bipolar disorder, I guess you could say doctors have been overconfident in um, diagnosing people with bipolar disorder, even though they may just show like one symptom or a bipolar disorder and think that, and it fits the criteria, criteria of bipolar disorder, but that doesn't mean that it is bipolar disorder. So that actually very surprised me of the, a lot of the overdiagnosis of bipolar disorder. Awesome. And so kind of a more comprehensive approach, like you were saying, could help with that too as well. Mm -hmm. Great, awesome, yeah. thank you so much. Um, and we're right on time. So now I'm gonna ask Rishi to uh, join. If you have any other questions for Mitra, feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, are you able to hear me? I can hear you, yep. Okay, thank you. I'll just share my screen. For me, it's kind of like, oh, it's reloading. OK, do you guys down. see my title screen? Yep, looks great. OK, perfect. I'll go ahead and start. So my presentation is on the impact of anthropogenic disturbance on arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi community structure. And what that basically means is that I looked into how human impact um, harms or assists these specific type of fungi in um, their work and different species, uh, different species that occur in different areas. So um, some information about myself is I'm very interested in ecology and mycology. I'm a current junior in high school and I have a strong background in environmental conservation and advocacy, which actually led me to to start looking into this topic. So to start off, um, environmental degradation has been there since the dawn of humankind. Um, since like the lower Paleolithic times, humans have developed tools unlike other, or unlike most other species. And they've used that to cultivate the land, to grow crops and um, to like hold sheep and to hold cows. Um, since like the advent of the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, um, there's been an insane amount of population growth, as well as new agricultural technologies that have created a lot of environmental harm. Um, and then some examples of that are like monocultures and different types of farming that really impacts global biodiversity. And the main focus of my paper is to look into how humans or anthropogenic effect um, contribute to declining global biodiversity. So my paper focused on fungi and ecological sustainability of biodiversity is rooted in fungi. So a really helpful analogy to understand what fungi is, is basically like a mushroom and an apple. So a mushroom is like an apple of an apple tree it, it's really like the part where, or like the part of fungi that people see most. And it's like something that comes out of fungi. Um, those lines that you see at the bottom of this little mushroom are something called hyphae. And it's, it's something commonly referred to as the wood wide network. Um, and every single tree or most trees and plants are connected through these hyphal networks. Um, and that's really what fungi is. Um, and some quick information is that 80% of vascular plants have a mutualistic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi, and plants rely on this mutualistic relationship for water acquisition, to, for mineral acquisition, and also for connecting with local and um, species that are right next to them and to form a bond with them. And this is really important for global biodiversity. So within fungi, I looked into arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi community structure. And what community structure is, is it's basically the measure of fungal biodiversity and volume in a given area. 
And this image on the right is basically a cross section of a root of a plant. And it shows how the purple part is basically the hyphae and the mycorrhiza interacting with the root of the plant. You can see that it's gone through the cell wall and it's actually a part of it now. And that's how it looks like in most of the plants in your backyard and beyond. And this kind of structure is very susceptible to anthropogenic disturbance. And there's a variety of disturbance types like soil disruption, agricultural disruption, host perturbation, and chemical disturbance. And I focused on a few of these. So I used a meta-analysis method to look, at, look into this topic. Um, and a meta-analysis is basically a statistical analysis that combines the results of multiple scientific studies. So I harvested data from a wide variety of studies to, to basically interpret it. So my methods was, as I as stated before, I found the data via research papers and the different context classes that I separated my, my data into were undisturbed, above ground, agriculture, and chemical disturbance. And all of these disturbance types are all impacted by humans. Um, and for areas that were disturbed by salt concentration, I basically separated them based on salinity concentration. So areas that were extremely high in salinization, um, I counted as disturbed and areas that were moderately or lower, I did not count. So a few diversity measures that I used to describe these communities were species richness, which is, which is the number of identified AMF species per soil sample, as well as the Shannon diversity index, which is a very common index for measuring species diversity in, in ecology. So this is a few plots showing where I got my data, and it shows the location of my data. I used 17 papers for this meta-analysis, and you can see that I used data all across the world and tried to go against finding data in one specific region of the world, which would have added bias to my paper. So my first result was that um, AMF fungi species richness was not greater in undisturbed areas. So you can see on my box plot on the right that um, my undisturbed class is actually the one on the very, the very right. And it goes from above ground to agriculture to chemical. And you can see that chemical had the very lowest and above ground and agricultural disturbance had a, a quite similar disturbance level to undisturbed. And then for my Shannon index results, found out that the undisturbed group had a greater Shannon index compared to the disturbed group. And this kind of um, connected with my hypothesis as this is really what um, I expected. And my discussion was, um, I found out that anthropogenic impact will disturb AMF community structure. And that's what I really hypothesized. Um, but this paper went above and beyond in categorizing what type of con context impacts AMF communities the most. And I found out that that was chemical disturbance. Um, a few questions that I ran into after looking at the data were, why is the AMF doing really well in areas of above ground and agricultural disturbance? And a few examples of that are logging, forest fires caused by humans, um, agriculture, like creating a monoculture, etc. And looking into a few papers, there were a few hypotheses that the species pool in an area that is affected by above ground and agricultural disturbance actually selects species that are highly um, disturbance resistant, um, which are generally not the indigenous species of the area. And that really harms the entire ecosystem because other animals, like um, other animals, plants and birds, etc. They, they are indigenous, and when these non-indigenous AMF species become acquainted and thrive in this, these disturbed areas, it does throw off the balance in the entire ecosystem. And I did find out that the most harmful anthropogenic disturbance type for AMF community structure was chemical disturbance. And the main focal point of chemical disturbance is salinity and trace metal pollution, which is very common in modern times. So my conclusions were that 
AMF community structure is dependent on disturbance type. Um, there were a few studies like published 2017 and, and afterwards that looked at different context de dependent um, disturbance types for AMF communities. But my paper did go above and beyond and it went much farther than those papers because it focused uh, primarily on anthropogenically disturbed areas which are disturbed by humans. And I feel like that does offer a lot of insight on climate policy, um, modern conservation methods, as well as different tools that modern like institutions use to like find out which areas to build and, and land use strategies. So looking into the future for chemical disturbance specifically, since that is like the most harmful type of disturbance, um, it is ubiquitous in the 21st century um, so I did theorize in my paper and I did put forth a few solutions um, for changing agriculture and industrial practices because um, they are quite harmful because of their land use strategies and their technologies that do hurt the species um, and one of them being um, AMF species. So yeah, that's what I really got out of my paper. Um, I do want to thank my mentor, Katie. Um, she's a PhD candidate at Cornell who studies um, ecology, and she advised my entire exploratory and writing process, and as well as like the Polygens program, which provided an environment for me to, to write this paper. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I really impressive. Uh, and so again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. One question that I have for you is, is there a way to kind of bring back the balance? So once these communities are impacted, is there any way to kind of revert them back to what they were previously? Or is that really a, a difficult feat to do? Yeah, so I did read a few papers that mentioned that over time, the like the biodiversity of the area of AMF species did return but the only issue was that it wasn't native species. They were species that were like not primarily found in that area before disturbance. So I guess in future research, I'll, I, I'm sure like this is a great topic to look into where um, like how to return the indigenous species back to the land with like changes in land use type and stuff. Awesome. We have a, another question in the chat. Uh, where you mentioned you have there, you kind of proposed some solutions, uh, and so they want to know what are some of the solutions you put forth in your paper. Um, my most effective solution, which um, like might not be the most feasible, is um, like minimizing the impact on the environment just by prevention. There's two types of like prevention. Like there's like prevention before even establishing any type of like agriculture or anything and mitigation, which is like trying to stop something after it already happened. So the most effective form of not harming the environment is not it, not touching it at all. So um, that was one of one of the thing, things I mentioned was like to prevent or to, to stop look, going into like new untouched territories and doing major things like deforestation, um, agriculture, et cetera. So yeah, definitely minimization of land use. Great. And uh, I'll kind of close us out here, but if any questions roll in, feel free to continue to submit them. Um, but I want to thank all of our student presenters. We're so proud of all of the work that everybody has been able to accomplish. It's really impressive. Um, and I also want to extend a really warm thank you to all of our audience members to come uh, that came today to support students in their efforts. Uh, we're really happy that you were able to do so today. Uh, and